shit. We lost Max in the Zoom. Uh, no Max this week. Sorry. Well, right. it's just me and you, like the old I days. I don't even need headphones now. We don't need headphones. At all. <laughs> we got to figure this out. Poor Max. Satellite we just in. Need to... We just need the... Adapters. Adapters. And then change your output to your interface and you'll be fine. We'll buy some adapters. If only there was like... Three bucks, dude. A big like national supply chain of audio equipment in the local area <laughs> that we could go to that was reliable and trusted and you know we had a history with i don't know who fucking guitar center went out of business <laughs> there's no hope season four we'll get there what are we doing are we doing cocaine bear or are we doing the we're march madness we're definitely doing cocaine bear did max want to be in a march madness kind of yeah but well then we should wait i mean it starts pretty soon we can wait we'll hold off we'll hold off all right we'll delay it so now that we got that out of the way. All right. Cocaine Bear. Do you think he'd win in a fight with Kangaroo Jack? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure, dude. I haven't seen Kangaroo Jack. I just, he seems like he's on Molly or something. He's definitely chemically enhanced. Yeah, no, he is. Uh, <laughs> I saw it a long time ago. Steroids. They promoted the living crap out of it on Nickelodeon as a kid. Yeah. Isn't it kind of like risky for a kid's movie? Like it um, looks like a kid's movie, but there's actually like drug deals and stuff going on. Yeah. We don't yeah. have to talk about Kangaroo Jack. What? That was just a bad. But anyway. What did you think of this? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, where's Max? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I thought it was awesome, man. It started off really strong. Yeah. And I was interested all the way through. I thought I thought maybe I'd get bored because it's just, you know, the premise of the movie doesn't really ever change. Yeah. But how they have different stories going at the same time, like different point of views. Yeah. They picked really strong characters for that. Oh, yeah. Alden Ehrenreich was great. Who? I don't think he's done anything since Solo. Who's that? Um, the dude who had John tattooed on his chest. Oh, he was great, dude. Yeah, he was awesome. In the very be- he was actually one of my favorite parts. Him and uh, Isaiah Whitlock, the guy from The Wire, the cop who had the yeah. dog adopted. Yeah, no, his part was really good. I was bummed that he died. Yeah. <laughs> I was really bummed that he died. There but- were parts of me that wanted it to be a little more extreme, I think. I mean, it was obviously pretty what do you extreme. Mean? <laughs> What about when that girl got the hospital bed that upside the down? The EMS chase was the best part for me. It got out of the gate with some like really funny shit. Like just yeah. like the commentary at the bar with that oh, yeah. guy you were talking about. <laughs> He's like, just eating plain noodles. Yeah. That was my favorite part. The kids were hilarious. Like yeah. I didn't expect kids to be doing coke and cocaine. Bear. I know, man. <laughs> I thought that was awesome because shit was unexpected. Like those kids to sniff a line was... <laughs> I, I don't know if that's even like has that is been that done a before? Is that <laughs> I don't know if it has, and done so innocently too. Yeah, like I didn't feel like I felt like they were crossing a line, but they made it feel it was it felt very kid like. Like the kid was yeah. like, yeah, I do coke all the time. Like right. that sounds like one of your shithead kids when you're ten. Yeah, but I was like, maybe he's older than I think he is. He looks seven. Maybe he's like fifteen. That'd be a little more normal. Yeah, but I don't think he was fifteen. No, they seemed young. Yeah, they had like. <laughs> crayons in their backpack i mean <laughs> yeah this is also in the 80s so like they're not yeah. gonna have much else that, that's all you need to say it's, it was the 80s <laughs> i think even though i kind of wanted it to be a little crazier like it's probably good that it was grounded because otherwise it's like you know just ridiculous and you don't take it serious but yeah i think all the characters like were grounded enough to make you actually care about it as opposed to just seeing like a bunch of cartoon characters run around and get killed by a cgi bear for sure there was <laughs> even some characters that got killed that i was like i was wondering who was even going to make it out at the end there yeah like you you kind of knew or thought like that they're not going to kill carrie russell right like carrie russell isn't a character that gets killed or I the mean, kids they already had the kids do coke I know. The kids could go. You don't know. That that was definitely when they set a precedent for it, huh? Yeah. And All th- bets are off. Yeah, I thought Elizabeth Banks did a great job as the director, really balancing the tone, like keeping the integrity of the story structure intact while also having all this crazy off-the-wall comedic moments. That was great. I'm glad to see her doing cool stuff as a director. I was afraid she would kind of disappear after that awful Charlie's Angels reboot. It reminded me a lot of Piranha 3D. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> I think I've seen Piranha. The I 2010 think... one? Okay, yeah. It's yeah. an old movie. Uh, no, not 2010. I think I saw an earlier version. The, like, 70s one or 80s? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> Is it in the same franchise as Anaconda? I don't think and so. And Jaws? No. The... Animals attacking? That's not the same universe? I mean, it's... Like Marvel? A the genre, but they're not a shared... Are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, it's you, not the same shared you think universe. Piranhas, like they all just exist in the same. <laughs> That's why I haven't watched Piranha 3D because I haven't seen Jaws yet. <laughs> no, they're not. Or connected. I haven't seen Lake Placid. I've seen Lake Placid actually. <laughs> Lake Placid is not connected. None of this is connected. 
what kind of like crazy animals should there be? Like the ayahuasca anaconda or like <laughs> Molly Python? The, the, the anaconda did ayahuasca and it woke up and changed its ways and stopped eating people and things. And that would be a great movie. Found itself. Mm-hmm. Spice tiger, peyote coyote. Oh, okay. Because they're Te- all doing drugs. I get what you're doing. Yeah. Now. Tequila mockingbird. Tequila mockingbird. <laughs> Tila Tequila, you remember her from MySpace? Yep, yep. She, she could be one of them. Yep, she was. And then a bunch of clones of her popped up. She's got clones? <laughs> well, fake accounts. They, oh, okay. Shit wasn't moderated back then, man. I thought she literally, like, got into some clone shit. Um, no, I don't think so. But, like, yeah, she had fake accounts. I think I... F- I follow her? <laughs> you seem embarrassed I, to admit it. <laughs> no, I'm trying to ex- explain where this is going, like... <laughs> Just the fake accounts on MySpace back then, since it was so low key. Once you like, like I searched Billy Joe Armstrong, there was only a few, and I thought I found the real one. <laughs> yeah. And I like talked to him. Did you message I, him? Oh yep. yeah. Did he ask for your social security number? <laughs> no. But the lengths at which like these fake MySpace people, he'd like post pictures of like his son, and then the son had his own MySpace, and they'd be like <laughs> commenting each other's page back and forth, like Damn. remember what I told you last night, son. <laughs> and I'm like, this is the real Billy for sure. Did they have the verified check marks in MySpace? I don't no, remember. No. Not, no, dude. This was like... I don't feel like there were celebrities on MySpace, were there? Just bands. So I, mean, I guess Billy Joe would be about as yeah. big as it gets. The Foo Fighters. This was when the internet was still basically in a whole beta phase. <laughs> yeah. I remember that was a big deal. When Against Me was blown up and they signed a sire, they got in the Foo Fighters top eight. I was like, oh, shit. Ooh. It's on. That's like, cool They're going to be big. <laughs> See, I miss... People will never get it. Um, <laughs> it was a cool little network of like it was, finding dude. new bands and like you don't get that with Instagram or Twitter. You felt closer or to Spotify. Like, Spotify should have like a social aspect. That would be cool. Or Bandcamp. Bandcamp is like falling behind. Do you agree though that you felt closer to the artists when you were like had them as a friend on MySpace versus like now you follow them on Spotify? On Spotify, yeah, but like I get responses from bands way more on Twitter and Instagram than I did on MySpace, but maybe that was because I was 15. and Yeah, <laughs> that could be something to do with it for sure. <laughs> All right, so we'll save the March Madness. We'll put it off till the 12th, I think, is the next episode. Yeah. For top 90s albums. Know. Did we decide? What do you think? Should we do sports movies or 90s albums? Because it's really hard to come up with 64 good sports movies, but it's really hard to narrow it down to just 64 90s albums. Like I have a whole... 64 of people outside of it who are your 90s albums uh who needs to be in the bracket the one seed to dookie is it all green day albums uh no because that's what um, me and max were talking about like narrowing it down to 64 records it's hard to get everybody represented and then you've got like all the repeats like obviously we got siamese dream but like melancholy and infinite sadness is really good does that get in there how many beastie boys records do we put on i want to have dookie and nimrod on the bracket Ooh, you want both Kinda. And you like Insomniac, and so does yeah. Corey from Prince Daddy. Yeah, but like, if you're gonna think about it as like a 90s staple, yeah. Insomniac's not it. It's got brain stew. Yeah. It has other singles, but nobody knows them except for me and Corey, probably. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know how there were singles. Like, if you played them at a party, not a lot of. Maybe Geek Stink Breath or Walking Contradiction. But then obviously, like. Dookie Slam. That's gotta be yeah. on there. That's a one seed for sure. Never mind. Yeah. Have you seen our bracket so far? <laughs> no. I haven't released it yet. I emailed it not? to you. Oh, okay. But yeah, our one Never seeds mind. are Nevermind, Dookie, The Blue Album, and Illmatic. Who, who, who's that? Nas. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I want to know. Oh, what about Smash? Smash is in there. I got That's a four seed. I think I'm higher on Ooh. that than everybody else. Yeah, so. no, I'm higher on that too. Um, yeah, we got Smash. That's the only Offspring record, though. We don't have Americana, even though Pretty Fly for a White Guy and all that stuff. Ooh, which Blink record should we put on? Because I got Enema. They're not even... Enema's 2000. That's 99? I don't Pretty think so. Pretty sure. Dude Ranch is 97. Yeah. Should... Enema of the state release date oh my god you're right dude i swore it was 2000 <laughs> it was june 1st 1999 then go. enema for sure yeah. it's undeniable that it's on there enema should go in over dude ranch yeah for sure <laughs> travis wasn't even in the band it's not blink yeah <laughs> any bush i don't i don't feel like there's a solid like front to back bush album they got good singles but like i don't know they were on the outside. I've got like 64 that aren't in the top 64, so there's a lot outside. I got no chili peppers, no corn. No no chili peppers. No chili peppers. What about any uh, tool? No tool. Hmm. I know. 
this list already sucks. It's hard, doesn't dude. It? it doesn't suck. It's just like <laughs> it is hard. Take all the ska bands out. <laughs> no. Turn off the radio is a great. Or what is it? Turn the radio off. I can try it again. At That's some a ten point. ten sky record. I think I've went long enough without it that I've cleansed my palate and I can safely go back to it. That might be the only. I don't know. Is rancid ska? They said it was. I don't think it is. I think that's the only ska records I have on there. Turn the radio off and and out come the wolves. But that's a 90s staple, Dude, right? Yeah. Jawbreaker. Weird Al. Mm. Should Weird Al go? Maybe that's. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe because he's doing songs that are somebody else's. So like he's got some originals on there, though. The Night Santa Went Crazy. <laughs> um, Pearl Jam. Should Pearl Jam go? No, probably not. I don't really like them, but... I don't either. I just feel obligated to have Pearl Jam on They are obligated pole. to be on there. <laughs> so what do you think are the best sports movies? Max said he couldn't come up with 64 of them. White Men Can't Jump? I barely did. That's in the list, right? For sure. I just love Woody Harrelson. Yeah, he's great. Kingpin. Uncut Gems. Is Uncut Gems a sports movie? <laughs> yeah. We asked it in the poll, and it was 52% no, 48 yes. KG's in it. Yeah, but... I mean, athletes are in all kinds of movies. Like, I'm not going to say Trainwreck's a sport movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, I mean, it's got a sports agent. It's sports it's got adjacent. LeBron. Yeah. Wait, would you consider Ford vs. Ferrari a sports movie? Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's a sport. Is I it mean, on there? Yeah. Because it's a good-ass movie. We got that. We got six or five Rockies. Rocky Five sucks, so we got one, two, three, four, and six. What about any of the Glee movies? Glee? That's not a sport. Show Car is not a sport, huh? <laughs> That's not a movie either. It's there's a TV the, there's show. probably a movie. There's a Glee movie? High School Musical? That's not a sport. No. Uh, <laughs> show I, just choir? Wanted, I just wanted to hear you admit it. <laughs> Wait, do you think Show Choir is a sport? Some people do. Are you one of those people? No. <laughs> I, I'm not. I mean, that's like a performance. That's like saying like music is a sport. Yeah. Or dance. I guess some people do think dance is a sport. Exactly. And it's a mix of the both, dude. Jesus. So I don't know. It's, it's tricky. Some people don't think racing is a sport, so that's why yeah, I, I took you down this rabbit hole. No, I got Ford versus Ferrari. I got Talladega Nights. <laughs> Talladega Nights, okay. I got Rush. Yeah, there's so many boxing movies. Yeah, too many, probably. Rocky, The Fighter, Raging Bull. Like, my favorite sports don't have good movies. There's no good basketball or football movies. <laughs> Unless you combine baseball and basketball and make basketball, which is probably my personal favorite sports movie of all time. But There's a new basketball movie that, that's coming out. With Woody Harrelson? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is with him, isn't it? Yeah. Is Semi Pro on there? Yeah, Semi Pro is on there. Which, okay. Now that you say it, I've got like two or three Will Ferrell movies. Blades of Glory is that on there? I don't think I have that one because I didn't think of it as a sport. But yeah, it's, figure skating's in the Olympics. That's basically just, that takes more talent, I would think, than racing. And they're racing on ice and doing tricks. I mean, talent's different, though, than like athleticism. Is there athleticism but it probably for takes more athleticism to yeah, figure dude. skate than to turn left for 400 laps. Yeah, dude, for sure. <laughs> All right, so today on Internet Killed the Video Store, we have with us Dean Bahar. You know him from Orgasmo, Cannibal the Musical, and celebrating the 25th anniversary of basketball in Squeak. Thank you for joining us, Dean. Hi, thanks for having me. I guess let's go back to the start a little bit. You met up with Trey Parker and Matt Stone, creators of South Park at the University of Colorado at Boulder, working on their student film, Cannibal the Musical. What was it like filming that project as kind of this intern credit spring break project and seeing it morph into this cult phenomenon? It was awesome. It was a lot of fun to work on. It was an amazing experience because it taught me basically how movies are made, how a feature is made. It's kind of funny because when I watch it now, it's more like watching an old home movie. It just feels like I was, you know, watching footage of me hanging out with my buddies in the mountains and making each other laugh. But it was a really cool experience on a lot of levels because it was also educational. You know, I think all of us learned a lot more about Alfred Packer than we knew before. Um, we were all familiar with him because the school kind of it kind of celebrates them in a way. The CU campus actually has a restaurant that's <laughs> on campus at the student union building that, um, God, I can't remember the name of it now. It, that's terrible. But it, it has something about Alfred Packer. I think it actually might be called the Alfred Packer Grill. Wow. <laughs> which is really kind of gross because they serve yeah. meat there. So you're like, wow, okay. Is it human? Um, so yeah, we always just kind of thought it was a funny thing for a while. And then we got to dive more into the actual history of it. And we're like, wow, okay. It was cool because we actually went to a lot of the locations that Alfred Packer actually traveled to. So it was probably the most extensive educational field trip you could have ever had. 
because we actually went to all these historical landmarks and then like recreated in our heads, well, in Trey's head, what might have happened, what might have transpired. And I think that what he actually created in the script, although it's really silly, it could be true. It could be totally true. <laughs> so who knows? Because we don't really know the full story about why all these people died while they were in the company of Alfred Packer, but pretty good guess that he killed them. But I don't know. Maybe it turned out the way Trey said. <laughs> right, right. So after working on Cannibal the Musical, you moved to LA and worked with them on a movie called Orgasmo. In between there, though, there's a little bit of a gap where you were kind of just working in Colorado. Did you think, you know, maybe maybe this is it? Maybe I'm not going to take that leap to being an actor? Or did you ever have any doubt in your post-graduation days? No, I never had any doubt about it. It was just more of a question of when, okay. um, because I knew I needed to save up enough money to move out there and I needed to have money for you know first and last month's rent and a deposit and I knew rent wasn't going to be cheap in LA so after I graduated I basically just worked some side jobs just to save money I lived with my parents and I was like I know I'm going to move out there at some point once I have enough money to do it I just don't know when that's going to happen but thankfully when orgasmo happened it paid me enough money that suddenly I did have the cash to finally you know, load all my stuff in U-Haul, made the road trip out here, actually drove out to LA with Matt's girlfriend. Oh, we nice. actually, yeah, we kind of uh, shared the, the expense of that, of moving out there together, which was nice to have somebody on that road trip. And then, uh, then I just stayed here. I moved down to Marina del Rey, which is a really beautiful little sea town just south of Marina. And uh, Playa del Rey is kind of this own little, like, little community. So when I moved out to LA, even though I was in LA, I still felt like I was in this cooler part of LA because I was there with Trey and Matt, which was cool enough, but in this little sea town that kind of had its own little world to it. I had this amazing beach vibe and all these parties there. That was an amazing experience when I first moved out here. I think it was probably the coolest transition I could have had from being in the Midwest in Colorado in the mountains, which I love, to then just being right on a beach. Like our apartment was literally right on the beach. I could jump out my bedroom window and I would hit sand. It was phenomenal. It was a blessing. It was really nice. I, I got lucky that way. I didn't have to you know, struggle for a while. Well, I guess I was struggling. I was sleeping on their couch. I didn't have my own bedroom yet. I was sleeping on Trey and Matt's couch for a while. And then, uh, then moved into that apartment with my own bedroom then because Trey and Matt started making a pretty sizable income from uh, <laughs> South Park. So they moved into a nicer spot. And then a couple other college friends moved into the other spots. And uh, yeah, I lived there for a few years. Yeah, so we so finally got kicked out. We were trying to make some student films there. I call them student films just because we were still trying to learn how to make movies together. And uh, we got kicked out because we left too much uh, props and set design, like fake walls and things we'd made and set up on the beach. We had those all laying up against the side of the building gotcha. at our apartment. And the landlord, unfortunately, came by one day and saw that and just <laughs> immediately kicked us out because one of the clauses in our I think in our uh, in our lease was that we weren't supposed to film anything there, which we thought was weird. Like, you should be able to film whatever you want at your home like what's that's what no we're gonna make some movies and so we did and it got us kicked out of the apartment <laughs> so we all had to move out after that so it wasn't like a culture shock really going out to la it was more of just kind of having this freedom of exploring all these creative avenues and finding new opportunities yeah, it wasn't so much a culture shock. It was more just people in LA immediately felt more relaxed than people in Colorado at times. I think yeah. they just kind of had a different kind of attitude. Like they they would just blow each other off, not showing up for stuff, just by <laughs> literally saying, I flaked. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like I found out that you could say I flaked or I just, I'm sorry, I just didn't make it. And that was a reasonable excuse. <laughs> like in Colorado, if I'd made plans with friends and one of them just like, I just couldn't do it, dude. We'd be furious. We'd be like, why? What was your fucking reason? <laughs> but in LA, you can actually say, I just couldn't do it, dude. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, all right, bro. I get it. <laughs> it's like, what? I'm like looking around like, what are you guys getting? What do you get? This guy's rude. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so that was a bit of a culture shock of realizing that they're so relaxed. Or if there is an event, they'll show up maybe 10, 15 minutes late. Like, yeah. I haven't been to a single play or a concert in LA. When most, I would say 80% of the audience didn't show up about five minutes before the show started, <laughs> or maybe while the show was starting. Yeah, that's that was a bit of a culture shock, realizing that people just don't give a shit. They're like, time? <laughs> What's that? Like, right. they don't wear watches here. Like, nothing fucking matters. They show up when they want to. It's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess the camaraderie you guys had built between yourself, Matt, and Trey really paid off 
filming basketball and all the ad living and improvisation you guys were able to do on set. Originally, I guess I read that it was just supposed to be Matt and Trey and they kind of angled to get you into the role of Squeak. And you kind of just built that by ad living and getting more lines on set. Is that true? Not really. No, <laughs> no they uh, they did try to get me in the movie, but they weren't able to actually just do that. I had to audition. I had to audition yeah. about eight times. Oh, okay. I had to go to about eight different table readings. But each time that I went to a, an audition and a reading, they gave me more lines. Oh, cool. I wasn't improvising my lines. The director, David Zucker, was writing more lines for me. Oh, okay. Thankfully, he thought it was funny. So he, he's like, make him say this. How about this? And then once we got on set, they gave me more lines too. Like I was actually only supposed to be in the first scene in the movie, like the first 10 minutes where I'm showing up, turning off their gas and being oh, angry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was it. That was my, that was my whole scene. So I went into the movie expecting just that. That was all I thought I was going to get. Then they gave me another script and said, you're going to work tomorrow too. And then they gave me another script after that. I kept getting more lines every single day. <laughs> and by the end of the movie, I was third lead. They kept inviting me back to have more lines. I was only supposed to work for like maybe a week. And I ended up working 11 weeks. <laughs> I had my own driver. They had a Lincoln Town Car that would come and pick me up every morning and take me to the studio. Man, it was a dream. But once we did get on set, David Zucker was definitely open to some marginal improvisation. Like if any crew member, any I mean, anybody, even like a lighting guy, if they came up with an idea, it was like, hey, this is funny. David's like, well, if it made the crew laugh, then... Let's try. It. So he was really open to that. He was open to new ideas, but he was also a really great writer. He wrote really great jokes. So a lot of people assume that Trey and Matt had something to do with the writing of that. And they didn't. They didn't write it. We didn't write it at all. We maybe ad-libbed a couple lines here and there, but that's all the genius of David Zucker and his team of writers. He had about four or five writers that were working on it every day. They came to the set. They'd be rewriting things constantly, rewriting jokes. I'd be getting a new script the day of. And it was awesome too, because it was a great exercise in memorization. Because <laughs> I was like constantly getting new lines and I had already memorized some lines from something else. And they gave me new lines and I had to film it like in an hour. So I'd go sit there in my trailer and just like lose my mind having to memorize these lines, being kind of stressed, but I liked the pressure and then going out and doing it. Yeah. It was awesome. It was a great experience all around. Well, yeah, there's definitely a lot of creative energy coming off of the movie from David Zucker. Like he said, one of the guys behind Airplane and Naked Gun, just that combination of irreverent satire and Matt and Trey's sensibilities. It was just such a great blend, parodying the entire structure of professional sports. That zany... Yeah, I love those movies. Like right, Airplane was like one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. I, th I think it's actually still on the... Uh... Uh, the American Film Institute, the AFI, I think they have a top 100 list of best movies ever made. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Airplane's on it. Airplane's <laughs> one of those 100 movies. And Deservingly I so. think it totally deserves it because it doesn't lose any laughs. I go back and I watch it over and over again, and it's just as funny as the first time I saw it when I was in like fifth grade, I think. I was in fifth grade the first time I saw it, and I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. So then years later, to actually get to make the person that made me laugh so hard to make him laugh was just awesome. That was so cool. Did you ever have any starstruck moments going to basketball and being like, you know, as opposed oh, yeah. to Campbell the musical, getting to do scenes with, you know, Reggie Jackson and seeing David Zucker? Was there anybody you were just starstruck by? Oh, yeah. Like everybody. There were so many great cameos and so many great roles in that movie. God, it was fantastic. It was such an eclectic mix. I think the person that really like wowed me the most was Robert Vaughn. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I saw Robert <laughs> Vaughn just because I've been a fan of so many things he's done. I mean, he's a uh, he was a legend and getting to see him in person and talk to him and watch him act. That was amazing. Very cool. Very surreal. But, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned Reggie Jackson. He was actually a complete asshole. Really? Reggie Jackson is not a nice person. <laughs> no, that guy sucks. He was really mean, actually. Yeah. It was weird because I actually, you know, when he shows up on set, you know, he's like, he's Reggie Jackson. So he expects mm -hmm. everybody to realize he's Reggie Jackson, which is fine. He's a legend in sports. But he brought a bunch of baseballs for everybody and signed them and gave them out to people. Even people that didn't ask for one. He's like, here's my baseball. <laughs> and he signed it. And so I got one. I was like, oh, that's cool. I have a signed Reggie Jackson baseball. Yeah. And so then I knew that my sister and my family were going to be visiting. And my sister doesn't care about baseball, but I knew that she would think it was cool to have an autographed star athlete on something. And I was like, man, I'm going to ask him if I can get one more baseball for my sister. <laughs> Yeah. So I went over to his trailer and I knocked on his door and I was like, hey, man. And he's like, what's up, kid? And I was <laughs> like, holy shit. 
first of all, I'm like, I'm in, I'm in my thirties and I'm like, dude, I'm not a kid. <laughs> Holy shit. I didn't say that, but I'm thinking, right. Oh, fuck this guy. So then he's <laughs> like, what's up? And I'm like, I really appreciate you giving me a signed baseball. I was wondering if, can you sign one more baseball for my sister? She's actually going to visit the set next week. And she would think that was really cool. And I swear to God, he just looked at me and he goes, that's enough kid. Oh man. And he went back to writing something down on a piece of paper. <laughs> and I looked at that guy and I, I swear to God, it was everything I could do to keep from throwing my baseball at that dude's face. <laughs> like I was seriously like, fuck Reggie Jackson. This guy's a piece of shit. <laughs> so seriously, I, that was my experience with Reggie Jackson. That's yeah. enough kid. He couldn't take the time to autograph one more baseball. Right. That guy's a fucking tool yeah that's unfortunate I hated that guy yeah <laughs> fuck that dude so well, that's the thing that was one thing that was also really great about being on basketball is because i got to witness different people that i held in high regard i got to watch idols and actors and people that you've only seen on a movie screen and then you see them in person and you realize oh yeah they're just people they're just normal people and you should treat them like normal people yeah and then you find out that some of those people they forgot that they were just people. <laughs> right. And they start becoming different things, other beasts. Yeah. But I found that I think that most of the people that are actually truly talented mm -hmm. in Hollywood, the ones that are really genuinely talented, that are just like these epic stars, I would say most of those people are actually really cool, really nice people. I think it's the people that are kind of maybe still feel a little insecure, so they don't feel like they can just be genuine. Yeah. Yeah put on this facade all the time because that's their safe place but uh yeah it was a real eye opener so do you still keep in touch with matt and trey i mean it's a miles away of difference between when you guys were starting this movie and they thought south park was going to be canceled season one that's why they signed up for basketball correct yeah we're definitely still in contact i just saw them recently in uh was it october november we went to red rocks oh for yeah the, the big celebration for south park yeah yeah the anniversary concert yeah and primus and ween and Trey yeah. and Matt performed out there. That was a beautiful experience. Trey actually gave me a nice shout out from the stage, which was cool. Oh, nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a really cool experience. We got to hang out and party afterwards. And it was nice because they, uh, they're they so busy all the time, always doing South Park. And God, South Park just kind of takes over their entire life. Yeah. But uh, Matt doesn't actually live in LA, really. He's only here in Venice, I think, maybe during South Park season. But he's usually in Manhattan. Oh, and yeah. And Trey's like in Hawaii and Seattle and... Beverly Hills, he's just oh, wow. like <laughs> traveling around when he's not working. And so I don't actually get to hang out with them that much. They're not really in town that much. But yeah, yeah things change over time. I do. I, I'm still in contact with them. still friends with them. Now, have they stayed pretty grounded? I mean, they've got this Tony winning musical Oscar nominated for Blame Canada. I mean, they've, they've blown up quite a bit. What's it been like to watch them go from just college students to the massive clout that they have now? It's awesome. They're still the same guys. They're still yeah. really funny. And it's cool because they're also you using their clout and their celebrity to do some stuff that I think is important, like saving Casa Bonita restaurant, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is a Mexican restaurant in Colorado, which was always like an amazing spot for me and well, for Trey and Matt to go to. We're all from Colorado. Yeah. So as kids growing up there, Casa Bonita is sort of like a Mexican Disneyland. <laughs> they actually did a good job representing it in the South Park episode they did. It really actually is kind of that cool. But Trey, it always has had the worst food though. Like uh -oh. even as kids, when we went there for like birthday parties or we would eat the sopapillas yeah. and then not even touch the tacos. We'd eat the sopapillas with honey and then we'd run to go play the games and check out the events and things going on there. Because even as kids, we knew that the tacos and the burritos and the enchiladas and the stuff they're trying to pass off as meals. Yeah. Like, holy shit. It was so bad. Like they just didn't <laughs> give a shit. It was disgusting. So Trey and Matt were like, okay, we're going to save Casa Bonita and we're going to renovate it. And they hired like some gourmet chef who's going <laughs> to give like amazing food. Finally, Casa Bonita for the first time ever will have food that you can actually eat. Yeah. And it's going to be so cool. It's going to happen, I think, in May. So oh, I nice. think I'm going to go after the grand opening in May and, and hang out with them again and finally, finally <laughs> eat a taco at uh, Casa Bonita. <laughs> That's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, all you guys being big Colorado guys, did you ever try and angle David Zucker to try and get John Elway into the movie? No, no, <laughs> no, we didn't. No, we didn't go for any recommendations. I think he uh, he's got his own lineup of stars and celebrities he likes to work with. Oh, yeah. Like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and just different people that maybe he already has a relationship with. Yeah, yeah. So did you grow up with a lot of sports in your upbringing? 
Sort of. I mean, my dad was always into the Denver Broncos, so I would watch the Broncos just as a reason to hang out with my dad. I never really liked football. It was just something to do so I could hang out with my dad, and that was pretty much it. But soccer was always my thing. Soccer, I played soccer ever since I was 10. Played all through junior high and high school. I love soccer. Soccer is like my favorite thing. I've had season tickets for the LA Galaxy and LAFC. And now there's a new women's team out here, which is really amazing. They just started up last year, the ACFC. Yeah, Angel City Football Club. It's owned by uh, Natalie Portman yeah. and a few other different people. And I'm in love with Natalie Portman. So I love <laughs> going to those games because I get a chance to maybe see Natalie Portman hanging out out there. <laughs> but uh, women's soccer is really cool. I love it because it, I feel like it's uh, it's a little more technically savvy, I think, than men's soccer at times. I think men have a tendency to kind of use more brute force and kind of muscle each other around out there on the field, whereas women are not so eager yeah. to crash into each other. So I think some of their passing and ball control at times seems to be a little more precise because they're not really trying to bang into each other and they don't dive. They don't fall on the floor and actually, you know, roll around like the guys do. (laughs) The guys, it's ironic. The guys roll around like they just got stabbed and you'll never see a woman doing that. They're like, they're too tough and they're too cool for that. They're like, fuck this. I'm getting up and playing. Like they want to show that they're okay. I enjoy soccer all around. Women and men's soccer is amazing. And I I miss playing it. My knees can't take it the way they used to. I longboard now. I love skateboarding. That was something I really embraced when I came out here. I skateboarded a little bit in Colorado, but my friends were not into it. I was like the only one that did. Yeah. My cousin gave me a skateboard that he had. It was a Sim Screamer, which I still have. And yeah, it was just so fun to me to finally be in an environment where people were like, yeah, skateboarding. And then I advanced into a longboard. Oh, nice. And now I have to wear a knee brace because <laughs> my knee will fucking snap out. I, yeah. I actually dislocated a, uh, a kneecap oh. of skateboarding. So uh, <laughs> now I have to wear a knee brace. I'm like, those are the moments when I feel like I'm old. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit, I feel like I'm 20 all the time until <laughs> my knee goes, no, no, oh, no, yeah. you're actually older than that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I picked skateboarding back up during COVID and uh, took my dog around the neighborhood, hit a bump and broke a rib. So I know oh, exactly you what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> I've heard that's so ancient. painful. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. You just got to wrap it up and just deal with it. Yeah. Uh, breathing yeah. hurts. And uh, yeah, a yeah, lot just of things. Breathing hurts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a little gun shy now, but hopefully be on the board again soon. <laughs> yeah. I wear wrist guards, too. Oh yeah. I don't want to take a chance of breaking my wrist. So I just, I, I look like a nerd out there, but I'm like, yeah. fuck it. I wear my helmet. I got my wrist guards on. I got my knee brace. Better safe than sorry. <laughs> I'm ready to go, man. Do you have any uh, favorite sports comedies or sports movies growing up? I know there's a lot. Caddyshack, Happy Gilmore. You know, what's funny is uh, I love baseball movies. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I've never seen a baseball movie that I don't like. Yeah. It's the weirdest thing because I don't like baseball. I, I don't like it. I mean, I, I don't hate it, but I just, I don't follow it. I don't care about it. Yeah. I think it's kind of boring. I enjoy going to a game at the stadium just because I like the environment. Yeah. Just the atmosphere is kind of nice. It just feels cool to be there. But the actual game itself, I couldn't care less. Yeah. And I would never watch a baseball game on TV. That and golf. I mean, they're both the same league for me right. in terms of excitement. <laughs> so I really don't like it. But the crazy irony is that for some reason, that atmosphere breeds great films. Oh, yeah. Like I've never I've never seen a baseball movie that I didn't like. (laughs) Like It's the weirdest thing. I watch a baseball movie. I'm like, oh, yeah, baseball is kind of cool, but I would never watch a game. (laughs) (laughs) It's like it's a strange thing. I've I've never enjoyed playing it. It's weird. It it kind of has created this culture for itself where it's kind of this. It's like the all American sport. It's the it's Americana. So it feels like it's a piece of American history. I guess yeah. I, I I appreciate that aspect of it and how our culture has embraced it that way. And it's become this thing. But uh, I think soccer is really the only sport that I'm really into. One of my favorite things about basketball is uh, your guys' in-stadium band, Real Big Fish. Oh, yeah, yeah. Were you a big fan of like the ska punk of the late 90s there? Or is that something that just kind of happened? No, that was, that was actually my, that band was my introduction to ska. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I would, I'd never really followed that style of music before. And uh, it was cool. It's a good choice. I liked it. It's good yeah, music, yeah. good energy. So um, you mentioned earlier the whole craziness of their one week production schedule for putting together South Park. You actually did a couple voices for South Park, but not a ton. Is there any reason you haven't revisited that? Yeah, I got a letter from the Screen Actors Guild saying I couldn't do anymore. 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. They actually wrote me an official letter and said, you can't do any more South Park because it's a non-union show. Ah, OK. Yeah. So that's why you don't see any celebrity actors. There's no people that you know rec- that you recognize in any of the episodes now because uh, it's non-union. So I think Comedy Central was maybe trying to maybe save some money. I don't know because they uh, <laughs> they didn't they ever unionize it. So okay. literally, if, it, if it's not Trey and Matt doing a voice they'll pull one of the animators out of their cubicle that's on their computer and just have them do a guest voice. They're not in the union. They don't have to pay them actor wages. So it, gotcha. yeah, it's weird because when you're in the union, it's a very cool thing to be in the union because they protect you in a lot of ways. But in a lot of ways, it's almost like being in a band. And then they tell you that you can't jam with other musicians. Oh, okay. <laughs> unless they know those musicians, you know? Yeah. So it limits your, your possibilities and opportunities to sometimes be more creative and try things out. But in the long run, it, it protects you as an actor because it also protects the work that you're doing um, and makes sure that you're safe on set and certain guidelines and rules are followed. But it's definitely a double-edged sword at times. So you mentioned earlier uh, you rewatched Cannibal the Musical. Are you able to go back and watch yourself and not like critique it and criticize yourself too hard or you can enjoy your own work? On Cannibal, I can, yeah. Because yeah. Cannibal, <laughs> I just look at as just a fun memory. Yeah. But um, everything else I do, I have a tough time watching it because all I can do is watch the things I did and know I, I want to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to fix everything that I see as a problem. But uh, so it's hard for me. I, I always want to watch a movie. I'm not going to be like somebody like Johnny Depp who refuses to watch his movie after it's made because he's like, yeah. I lived it. I don't need to see it again. <laughs> well, I think that's ultimately disrespectful to everybody else that worked on that movie. Right. Yeah. Because you're not the only thing that was a part of that movie. There's <laughs> a lot of other pieces in that puzzle and you yeah. want to see the end result and why all those pieces came together to make it work. Of course, I'm going to watch the movie I worked on or a TV show. I think it's pompous not to. Yeah. Um, but when I do, I do look at everything I did and I'm like, oh, oh, I want to fix that. I want to fix that. Or sometimes very rarely I'll be like, oh, that's pretty good. That's all right. <laughs> sometimes, but gotcha. usually I'm just kind of like, ah, oh, damn it. Oh, I wish one more take. Is there one role or one line that people recognize you most for? Basketball and orgasmo for sure. Yeah. So it's funny because I'll get like, usually when I go to bars, somebody like college bars, they'll be like, squeak. Oh my God, it's Chota Boy. I would say squeak and Chota Boy. People will shout that. And then maybe a bartender will notice and I'll get free drinks. There you go. That's kind of a nice thing. Yeah. Whenever (laughs) a bartender notices me or recognizes me, drinks are on the house. So it's like, wow, you know, I'm really trying not to become an alcoholic right now. You guys are not helping us out. (laughs) No, we love the movie. I'm glad to have you on to celebrate its 25th anniversary. It's hilarious. One of my yeah. favorite comedies. Can you tell us a little bit about working on Nightmare Alley with Guillermo del Toro? That was really cool. I uh, It was a bittersweet memory because I actually, it's crazy. I, I went out there for two months and mm-hmm. they gave me my own apartment, which was awesome. I had my own apartment for two months, eight weeks I was there and I had 18 scenes. Oh, wow. And like I had a pretty substantial supporting role in it. And then they kept rewriting the script and rewriting the script. And there, I played like a freak character. It's like this carnival. And there's about eight or nine of the freaks. And I don't know exactly whose decision it was, but the word I got was that the freaks were a visual distraction Uh, and that they weren't pushing the story along necessarily. (laughs) And uh, you'll notice when you watch that movie, I think Bradley Cooper is in every scene in the movie. There's like no, there's no subplots. (laughs) <laughs> it, it's Bradley Cooper. It's the Bradley Cooper show. And he was also an executive producer on the movie. And he didn't want to wear any prosthetic makeup, which I thought was interesting. He had a gunshot that happens to his ear and he didn't want to wear the prosthetics. And I think he was not happy with the prosthetic look. Oh, I can't okay. speak for him exactly. I don't know whose decision it was. Yeah. But I, I think that ultimately what happened was that Guillermo decided to shift gears and not have so much fantastical elements within oh. his show. Mm -hmm. And he focused more on the Bradley Cooper character and his journey. And as a result, I was only in one scene. Uh, My 18 scenes got cut down to one scene at the end of the movie. And I'm even lucky that I'm in it because a lot of the other freaks, you don't even get to see them. Yeah. Like at all. It was insane. It was devastating because I had so many like fantasies and thoughts in my head about getting to act with Willem Dafoe and Kate Blanchett and Tony Collette and Bradley Cooper and like an amazing cast. And I had scenes with all these guys and Ron Perlman 
Yeah. So I was really stumped. I was like, this is incredible. And then I find out I'm only in one scene at the end. Uh, so that, that devastated me. I've never been suicidal, but that took me to a level of despair that I don't ever want to go to again. <laughs> I was so hurt. It almost felt like being a little kid and being told you're going to go to Disneyland. And then, <laughs> and, they, and they show you all the rides that are going to be there. You're going to be on Pirates of the Caribbean, Space Mountain, right. all these great rides you've heard about for years. You get to go there. You're going to ride those rides. <laughs> and then I go to the gate and they're like, actually, no, you, you can watch. You can watch the other people <laughs> ride on them. We, yeah. we don't have room for you right now. I'm sorry. Yeah. You just, you're going to stand at the gates and watch everybody else ride. And then at the very end, before the park closes, we'll let you walk down the main street. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to go home. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty much what it felt like. So that's gutting. I I had to take I had to take that opportunity and realize that I was in a really cool city. I'd never been in Toronto before, so I did sightseeing. I saw some amazing places. I took field trips on my own, but most importantly, I wrote my own screenplay. Oh, interesting! And that's when I really grabbed the reins and said, "You know what? I have got to stop waiting for other people mm -hmm. to put me in things. I've got to stop waiting for other people in general." I need to tell my own stories. I need to be in charge of my own product. And so I did. I wrote my own screenplay. I wrote a murder mystery that I'm actually now producing. Hopefully, maybe at the end of this year, or early next year, I'm going to produce it and co-star in it. And it's something I'm really proud of. It's a murder mystery called The Stylus. And okay. it's, uh, it's about murderabilia collectors, people who collect uh, crime scene evidence and anything associated with a murder. And it's a genuine thing. There's people that get together and have these parties and get togethers and dinner parties and they show each other their stuff. And so I, I wrote a movie about that because uh, I'm a friend of the guy that owns the Museum of Death in Hollywood. And uh, he's got one in New Orleans, but it's a really successful place, but it houses some really scary, creepy stuff. Yeah. And I took a tour of that museum and instantly it was like, oh my God, I need to write a movie about this. So while I was in Toronto, I wrote my screenplay finally about these murderabilia collectors that get together and they show something that shouldn't have been shown. And two people end up getting murdered to hide the evidence. And then this LA detective is trying to solve the double homicide with the help of a homeless guy who claims to be a time traveler. <laughs> and uh, that's the role that I'm going to play. I wrote it for myself. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like my sling blade, like Billy Bob Thornton. Right. <laughs> basically made himself into an actor on screen by doing Sling Blade. You know, he, yeah. it was a very popular play. It was a little one act play he did that gained some steam. So he made it into a movie and his career took after that. So I just, I use that as a template because I'm like, man, I just need to show people that I can actually do some really interesting, dramatic, creative work other than just, you know, funny stuff. Yeah. I love comedy. I'll, I'll never turn my back on comedy because it's always amazing. It's always fun. It's a, it's always great to make people laugh and smile. But I've got other stuff and other stories I want to tell. And I think that now I really am focusing on telling my own stories and creating my own product. So hopefully that will continue that way. Well, yeah, that's awesome. I look forward yeah. to that. It's Thank called you. The Stylus, you said. The Stylus, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to leave us with before we let you go here? Uh, I've got a band, too. Nice. Yeah, okay. we're going to be putting out an album this summer. Oh, nice. So that's something you can check out too. My band is called the Machines of Joy. Machines of Joy. Awesome. Machines of Joy. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm the lead singer. I write the lyrics. We're going to have some cool stuff hopefully soon. That's awesome. I'm guessing it's not ska. <laughs> no, it's not ska. Not ska. No. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I guess maybe I call it alternative rock. Okay. Cool. Cool. Awesome. I appreciate you taking the time for us today. And uh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. Best of luck with the stylus. Look forward to it. Thank you. Yep. Take care, man. Thanks.